We are so honored to have our speaker, Shannon Matin, with us here today. Uh, Shannon is the Penn Presidential Compact Professor of Media Studies and the History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we recently lost her to Pennsylvania, but I believe she's still spending a lot of time in uh, New York. Um, according to her bio on the um, University of Pennsylvania website, um, her dad owned a hardware store and makes beautiful furniture, and her mom was a special education teacher. And I really appreciate her putting this kind of lineage into you know, how she presents herself as a scholar. Uh, before Penn, between 2004 and 2022, she worked in the School of Media Studies and the Department of Anthropology at the New School and collaborated regularly with the Parsons School of Design. When I started my career as a teacher and scholar right here at GSAP, um, Shannon is who I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, over the last decade since I've been following her work, um, her work has brought together an astonishing array of subjects from libraries to sonicscapes to hardware stores um, as she took on ambitious projects aimed at redesigning the academy, thinking with trees, and of writing as grafting. Her practice has been described as recasting the field of design anthropology and media theory, but Shannon wears many hats. Uh, she is an activist, a design scholar, a writer, a geographer, a cartographer, an archivist, um, and as I was discussing with my students in the morning, a data philosopher, uh, a tree hugger in the best sense of the word, uh, and, an, and an advocate for open public access to knowledge. In one of her recent interviews, the interviewer described her as a gap-bridging intellectual. Uh, which I read as academic code for refusing to abide by disciplinary boundaries. Uh, but really, Shannon is one of the most important thinkers of our times. A thinker, and here I'm going to channel my inner Donna Haraway, a thinker whose thoughts we think thoughts with. Um, and with that, I will stop fangirling um, and invite Shannon to join us. Please, please welcome uh, Shannon with me. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you so much. And if ever I'm not pointing appropriately towards the microphone and you can't hear me well, just raise your hand and I'll try to project better. So this is a, the, I used to not be a procrastinator. I was the type of person who turned in work like a week or two early to the point that sometimes it was so early people would forget that I even handed it in. I have somehow over the past several years become the person who finishes 10 minutes before. So this is a brand new project of a work in progress. So it's kind of like doubly provisional, but hopefully that'll give you a, a chance to find knots in the, or whatever, I'm trying to think of the right metaphor here, is um, holes in the log, um, breaks in the trees to kind of insert your own voice. And I would love to get your input as I shape this in its next iterations. So as the first slide indicates, I'm gonna be talking with you about arboreal intelligence. So when Andres wrote me to invite me to be a part of this series, he asked me if I could talk about trees as data and the digitization of nature. Um, so, but I'll start with three short recent news stories that demonstrate the various ways that trees constitute data. First, the Canadian forest fires were diligently datafied, mapped, and registered quantitatively as air quality indices. And I'm assuming all of you were here for this just a couple weeks ago and probably checked a lot of these apps and maps as you went about your day. Uh, but they also brought a tragically common West Coast empirical experience to the East. They introdu introduced us to embodied, visible, visceral data. Data that's not just on a screen, but we can actually see and feel and breathe in indices of what was happening a thousand miles away. Um, an experiential index of a disturbance, as I said, hundreds or even thousands of miles away because it reached all the way down into Virginia in that region. Trees turned into ash, blown south as a portent of climate change. Second, consider Trump's attachment to his papers, clippings, letters, and other documents that reminded him of his proximity to power. These stacked slices of tree, a performative trope that recurred throughout his presidency. He loved to pose in front of big stacks of paper to kind of uh, demonstrate both his, his productivity and his uh, administrative prowess and um, just the important stuff that he got to touch every day. But here, 
Uh, in the most recent case, they were marked with consequential content, and thus most of it classified, and probably touched by important hands, and thus were stored vertically in cardboard boxes, themselves tree products, strewn across the Mar-a-Lago ballroom, bathroom, office, bedroom, and storage room, making them an architectural phenomenon. So I'm going to try to insert little things just like, this is how this is architecture. This is how it matters to architecture. So these piles of paper constituted bureaucratic monuments, very modest ones, obviously, an accumulation of ego and an emblem of willful disobedience. Uh, third, trees are a likely backdrop, backdrop that is at COP28, the UN climate talks that will be held this year in oil-rich United Arab Emirates, and where oil and gas companies will be well represented at the deliberations. Sultan al Jaber, um, head of the National Oil Company, has championed the need for, quote, abatement, a word that, as the New York Times notes, has resounded with frequency, uh, increasingly frequently, among some climate negotiators, and which seems to imply that, quote, climate goals and continued fossil fuel production are compatible as long as technology to capture their emissions is widely deployed, end quote. Emirati diplomat Majid al-Sawadi expects the discussion to focus on, quote, what we're building up, what we're scaling up, what we're speeding up, not what we're taking away from people. In other words, you don't need to sacrifice. You can have more, more, more. We're just going to give you technology to take away all the bad stuff. Given the historical popularity of tree planting initiatives in the UAE, we can bet that one of those abatement technologies will be trees, a convenient, charismatic green screen, an organic absorbent, an alibi for continued carbon emissions. The tree as a carbon absorbing technology scales up to a global measurable mass in the form of now ubiquitous tree planting campaigns. Precision forestry, uh, the consultants of McKinsey tell us, resembles agriculture in its focus on monocultures, selectively bred tree species, and a relatively high degree of automation. Satellite images and LIDAR scanners and soil sensors will enable loggers to adapt planting and harvesting to meet customer demand, to model terrains and water flow, to assess standing wood inventory, to more efficiently fell and cut specific items within that inventory, to optimize trees dissection into logs, to detect outbreaks of pests and disease, and to offer early warning of forest fires. Drones in the forest and on the farm can plant seeds and saplings, strategically spray for weeds and pests, and dispense fertilizer precisely where and when it's needed. One such company that does this is a company called Dendra, which performs ecosystem analysis and reporting, and then deploys drones for strategic planting, often in remote areas where it's difficult or, or dangerous for people to go. Data-driven arboreal solutionism, arboreal meanings relating to trees, solutionism meaning a, a kind of a methodology and approach that you're going to solve a solution with a technological kind of um, apparatus or methodology. It's also apparent in projects like Living Carbon, a biotech company founded by folks formerly associated with OpenAI and DuPont to genetically engineer trees that offer lots of measurable qualities that will be bigger, faster, and stronger, which appeal to reformers seeking quantifiable outcomes. Trees also become quantitative variables in carbon markets and as mappable anchors in plotting out more sustainable supply chains. Tree data are also emblematic of other forms of virtue, in this case, social equity, mapping urban tree canopy as a proxy for environmental justice. American Forest has made this correlation explicit in the form of a, a tree equity score. And some of this might be familiar to you from the, the um, uh, tree thinking piece. I promise you not all this talk is going to rehash the article. I'm just kind of covering some of the, recovering some of the terrain. And this tree equity score obviously uses cartography to indicate where trees can be strategically deployed to address myriad social injustices. We can deploy all the tools of big tech, satellites, sensors, LIDAR, artificial intelligence, to map the world's forests, count its trees, identify their leaves. Lindsay Wickstrom, in her recently published Designing the Forest, advocates for using computational tools to promote more sustainable forestry and environmentally friendly mass timber construction. But the digitization of forests isn't only a corporate or extractive enterprise. Consider local activists in Sumatra who are installing treetop monitoring units, used cell phones powered by solar panels, specially designed to work in densely foliated terrains, 
to listen for and distinguish between the sounds of chainsaws, logging trucks, and other sonic clues of illegal logging. Media scholar Jennifer Gabris and her Citizen Sense team in Cambridge, that's Cambridge, England, not the multiple um, universities in Cambridge, Massachusetts, deploy various computational tools to gather and render spatial data that can help us to better understand and steward our forests. I mean, there's this kind of tiny type here. This is the website for Citizen Sense. They're specifically their smart forest projects where you can see the various media forms the team uses from remote sensors to camera traps to even the blockchain as well as the various applications from forest observation to optimization to encouraging community participation and affecting regulatory change. Dave Gabris also warns that such practices could, quote, present the problem of environmental change through a particular set of metrics that in turn legitimate specific technological interventions to meet targets for averting environmental catastrophe. In other words, this chain of kind of self-reifying data with a technological solution. In other words, they could promote techno-solutionist responses to ecological, cultural, and political economic problems, which we also see manifested in proposals to solve the climate crisis, not by curbing extraction and consumption, but by performing carbon capture and fossil fuel recovery and by planting trees. <clears throat> There's a long history, one chapter of which is the rise of scientific forestry in the 18th century, wherein trees have been instrumented as solutions to larger problems. The artistic duo cooking sections, cooking sections that is, made this arboreal logic palpable, um, experiential, inhabitable, in a 2019 exhibit here right at Columbia which critiqued the notion that trees are meant to offset, in financially calculable terms, the deleterious effects of ecological degradation. Trees excuse us from having to address root causes. Notably, the trees in this exhibition have no roots. And this brings me to the intervention that I hope to make. Uh, my own roots in the field of media and information studies compel me to replant this whole discussion inside a more capacious conception of data and media. Trees, and plants more generally, have been inveterate partners in the history of mediation in multiple senses of the term. They've interceded between us and our environments by providing shelter and clothing, going back to kind of the very foundational history of architecture. They've also facilitated human communication and engaged in their own forms of communication. Thinking about how our arboreal forms populate the family tree of media history and how they can lead us toward branching future pathways can show that trees have been at the root of much of human cultural, social, economic, and political activity, and that our carbon-based lives are deeply entangled, entangled, that is, with theirs. This is a new project for me, or rather a newly grafted one that blends and builds upon a couple decades of prior endeavors and convictions. Because I'm still exploring and not yet able to see the forest for the trees in some of this material, I decided that it would be counterproductive for me to force this sapling of a project where I'm still reading dozens of books and thousands of articles and hundreds of, have hundreds of bookmarks and uh, cataloged a whole bunch of art projects that are relevant in design projects, instead of forcing it into an argumentative form solely for the purpose of sharing it with you, which would probably mess me up in the larger term of things, um, I'm gonna share something much more provisional. I will say I also hoped to use this semester a transition between my old institution, the new school, right down the street where I was for 20 years, to my new institution, the University of Pennsylvania, I'd hope to use this time to write a book proposal on arboreal media, but all those transitions unfortunately consume that time I would have liked to have been working on this project. I really do need to spend a few more weeks following the branches, finding the rhetorical trunks, and planting my own roots in order to determine the structure of the project. So what follows isn't really a polished text, although I'm gonna read some parts with a single argument. Instead, it's a graft, a partially scripted, partly extemporized presentation. I hope you'll think of it as a forest of references through which I'm trying to map my way, and I hope you can help me with that. So returning for a moment to the family tree, I want to tell you a bit more about my own roots to situate this project autobiographically. Last week, my dad drove from central Pennsylvania, where I grew up, to visit us in Philadelphia. The past few years have been pretty difficult for our family, as I'm sure for everyone, because of the pandemic and all the destruction it has wrought, um, and especially for him. They've included lots of loss and grief and alienation, including from many of the things he's loved. Not long ago, Dad spent most evenings and winter weekends in his wood shop, 
making furniture for family and friends, or repairing pieces for patrons at the hardware store that he and his brothers inherited from my grandfather. Here are a couple of his high boys, all hand carved. Here's my mom's desk. Here's her spice cabinet. He made one for me too to house the jewelry that I never wear. Here's my desk. And here are the shelves that we built together when I lived in Philadelphia 20 years ago in a loft and I needed something big enough to move around and actually serve as a uh, space divider. Sadly, I had to give them away a few years ago when we moved from Peter Cooper Village down on 23rd Street to Hudson, two hours north of the city. So after two decades of lugging these huge seven foot things around between Philadelphia and multiple New York City apartments, only choosing apartments would actually fix, I could fit them in the door and up the steps. It was a house in Hudson that kind of did me and I couldn't get them in the door. So I had to give them away to a friend, which was a very sad departure. The wood shop, which dad built himself, sits at the end of the driveway, encircled by hickories and pear trees, and across from it, a shed that holds roughly 40,000 board feet of cherry, walnut, tiger and bird's eye maple, mahogany, and purple heart, as well as several feral cats. Care for his parents, and more recently my mom, has kept dad away from his chisels and lathes for the past few years. While he speaks often of missing the sounds and smells of woodworking, he finds it hard to muster the motivation to open the door and turn on the shop light. He also, in our tiny small town, actually the village probably has a couple hundred people, the closest town has about 5,000 people, so it's pretty rural. There aren't too many skilled craftspeople that he can form kind of a self-motivational group with in this area. So we designed his trip to Philadelphia to reacquaint him with trees in both planted and plank form. So on his first afternoon, we visited the Philadelphia Woodworking Company, who created the built-in bookshelves in our new house in Philadelphia. My dad and Matt geeked out over a tank-like German planer from the 1970s. They talked about dust collection systems and lumber sourcing and finishing techniques, sharing arcane knowledge and using terms that, much to my delight, excluded me from the conversation. I didn't really care that I was involved. I was just glad that he was excited about what he was talking about. Later that afternoon, we stopped at the Museum for Art and Wood, whose collection focuses on turned wood, but whose current exhibition features mash excuse me, current exhibition features mashrabiya, Islamic screens, ornamental apparatus that aided in climate control. And if you know Daniel Barber's work who writes about the prehistories of climate control, he talks about some of these architectural interventions that helped to control climates before we had HVAC systems, or they're kind of proto HVAC systems. The next day we visited the Warden Eschrick Museum. And if you haven't been there, it's not far, not a far drive from New York, highly recommend it which includes the home and studio of this key figure in the American studio craft movement. Eschrick started off as an impressionist painter, then began carving his own frames, uh, then took up wood block printing, and finally moved to sculpture, furniture, and architecture. Thus, across his career, Eschrick engaged with the tree in various forms, as a scaffold for a canvas, as representational subject matter, actually kind of carving or painting trees, as a print substrate painting on materials made of trees, as sculptural medium, and as building material. Perhaps not surprisingly, his home in Malvern, roughly a half hour outside of the city, feels like a tree house. The surrounding wooded landscape provided many of the necessary resources for the buildings and the objects they housed. Our next stop, Longwood Gardens, an estate founded by Pierre Dupont, a key figure in the early 20th century chemical and automotive industries. The now public facility features forest, wetlands, agricultural fields, a conservatory, and formal gardens. Here, trees function as specimens, as exemplars, as ornamentation, um, as representational subjects, as test subjects, as investments. Quite prescient for a family whose business ventures would contribute so profoundly to environmental degradation. And the following day, we visited the George Nakashima House studio and workshop, where visitors excuse me, where visitors can observe the process from procurement through production by which the esteemed woodworker and his daughter Mira and their team realized the quote, one ideal use of each plank in their collection, yielding iconic live edge chairs and tables. It became clear that Nakashima's reputation steeled the supply chain for the organization, 
His reputation became so big that anytime anyone felled an old growth oak, walnut, or maple, or redwood, they'd send the enormous dust specimen to the workshop, where it would be custom milled into huge planks and stored in boule form, which is kind of like keeping all of the, it's almost like keeping it in a slice bread, where you keep all the pieces that actually came together in a log, you store them in the, the order. If any of you know anything about archival practice, there's a concept called respect du fonds, which means keeping things in their original order. That's kind of what this is, too. These five sites exemplify different, yet often entangled arboreal logics and aesthetics. Engineered order and organicism, standardization and customization, machinic processing and manual craftsmanship, individual genius and collaborative cultivations. They embody different forms of dendrological loyalty and sylvan sympathy. I really like alliteration, as you can probably tell, and I'm not aware of it until I actually say things aloud. Um, they cultivate and necessitate different modes of arboreal intelligence. For the past 20 years, my research has resided at the intersection of digital infrastructures and material spaces. I've written about the design of library buildings, the creation of counter-institutional collections, ethical practices in digital archives, urban communication infrastructures, logistical systems, cartographic practices. I've always sought to highlight the productive integration of old and new media, of data and various forms, of multiple intelligences. Yet after over a decade of writing about smart things, smart objects, smart cities, smart systems, smart whatever, I've grown a little weary, I'm actually not a little, a lot weary of the term. This current fetishistic and hubristic discussion of artificial intelligence that we hear, chat GDP changing the world, totally transforming education, killing the college essay, ruining screenwriting, everything, you name it, and also the hubris that comes along with those claims too, um, uh, and, and the supposed uh, demise of the arts and humanities because the, with the, uh, as a response to the, or as a consequence of the prioritization of STEM, science, technology, education, and management, and math, have left me rather dejected. I have to say, what boring, myopic conceptions of what constitutes data and intelligence, reifying HQ, uh, excuse me, IQ, all of these discussions, if any of you are on social media who are demanding that the, uh, the people debate one another, they always like pull out the IQ, challenging somebody as if we're kind of actually buying into that as a measure of someone's intelligence. Weaponizing statistics, fighting over standardized test scores, and forcing false binaries, mandating reductive classifications. These are all forms of kind of quantitative, positivist thinking that I don't really find super interesting, really. So I've sought to engage with a different kind of intelligence, one of a more organic, ecological sort. If, and I'm assuming most of you here have read my piece on tree thinking, which was noted in the description for this event and required for those of you in the class, as I understand it, uh, you, you've likely seen that I talk about the tree as a formal and conceptual means of organizing knowledge, as we see manifested in things like the dichotomous key classification or decision tree algorithms and the family tree. I'll admit that my own family tree <clears throat> Uh, and its recent morphological transformation has been a primary source of motivation for this project. I want to capture the modes of intelligence, the variegated forms of data inherent in the wood shop, in the forest, in the orchard, in the arboretum, in the hardware store, and the materials, ideas, and values they help us cultivate. I also want to author, author, excuse me, honor the capacious and compassionate forms of intelligence manifested in my mom's work as a special education teacher for over 40 years as well as the cognitive evolution we experience collectively as her mind and memory are transformed by Alzheimer's. So yes, this project on arboreal media, I think I might have skipped one too far. Where is, sorry. There it is. So yes, this project on arboreal media, along with a parallel project where I'm gonna be focusing on intellectual furnishings, the furniture we create, modify, and restore to preserve and organize our media and support our intellectual labor. They constitute what some people call a form of me-search, a type of investigation that has occasionally been disparaged by scholars and practitioners who equate intelligence and rigor with critical distance and impartiality. One of the selling points of data-based work is its presumed objectivity and exactitude. Computers aren't supposedly aren't tainted by subjectivity and emotion, by situational variables and historical legacies. But the critical discussions around AI demonstrate just how partial each development and application is. 
and how impartially they're often deployed, reinforcing or exacerbating social inequities. Black feminist and indigenous scholars in particular have long acknowledged the impossibility and impoverishment of failing to at least reflect on one's investment in and influence over the work they do, whether research or design or policymaking. Plus, the work on Arborean intelligence builds on an assortment of projects that has accidentally accumulated over the past decade or so. That's my own projects, that is. So I've written about geo-archives, including especially the Lamont Doherty collection, which is right across the river. It's part of Columbia University in um, the Palisades. If any of you have a chance to go there, highly worth a visit. Uh, so I looked at the um, geo-archives and the use of sediment, and ice cores, um, corals, and tree rings as data sources about climate change. I've written about organiz the organizational logics and aesthetics of building materials and hardware stores. I've written both in a 2018 exhibition broad broadsheet and in my 2021 book about grafting as a poetic practice and an intellectual method. I've written about the parallels between the green screen, a technique of chromatic compositing, um, and green washing. I also, I think next month, actually, this is coming out, a piece about arboreal law, tree law, and how ontological questions about what actually constitutes a tree inform how a tree itself is conceived as property and how trees often determine the boundaries of landed property. And as I mentioned earlier, I've written about tree thinking. My ex earlier explorations of grafting prompted me to investigate trees as epistemological objects, like things to think with, things that shape our thinking. Trees as sites where people gather to think and make important decisions. Trees as embodiments of data and countable things that shape climate science and policy. Trees as conceptual and methodological models for human and automated classification and decision making. And trees constituting networked organic systems of communication. Now I want to organize this work into an arboreal or rhizomatic form that exemplifies the deeply rooted, widely branching realm of arboreal media. So in our remaining time, we'll follow just a few of those branches. The first is trees as media substrates, substances, or scaffolds. Some of this, again, might appear um, familiar, but a lot of it will be new, I hope. So the Sumerians fashioned reeds into the styli they used to make wedge-shaped marks on clay tablets. Egyptians pressed strips of papyrus into the sheets on which they wrote texts in red and black inks, themselves composed of charcoal and acacia gum mixed with lead or copper. And later, around the second century BCE, the Chinese began mashing tree bark, hemp, and rags together to make paper. And about a millennium later, they began using trees in the form of wood blocks to create prints. Up until the late modern period, plants, leaves, and stems became media by succumbing to mechanical forces and organic processes, stripping, mashing, scraping, washing, fermenting, pressing. Eventually, chemicals like lime and chlorine aided in papermaking process to make possible the creation of new techno-botanical media. In the late 19th century, George Eastman created celluloid film by combining camphor derived from the camphor laurel plant and nitrocellulose, itself a compound formed by exposing cellulose, the building blocks of plants' cell walls, to nitric acid. All this is to say so much of our history of media is actually drawing on bot botanical stuff, whether it's paper or even something seemingly plastic like film. Vast forests enabled the rise of ma the mass press around the same time. As Michael Stamm writes in his book, Dead Tree Media, we should expand our understanding of what constitutes the newspaper industry, which sadly, you probably was dying in its material form, unfortunately, to include not only publishers and journalists, but also lumberjacks, paper mill workers, chemists, and policymakers who incentivize American publishers to favor Canadian newsprint. Early 20th century editions of the editor and publisher regularly discussed forestry and paper mill news, they reported that in 2000, they reported in two, sorry, 1911, that is, the New York governor, John Dix, at the annual dinner for the New York Press Club asked, do you realize that in this country alone, it requires 300 acres of timberland a day to supply the paper to distribute the news? Again, not the case today, but an important historical consideration. Without paper reforestation, we cannot hope to maintain or to obtain this supply indefinitely. A decade and a half later, the trade journal's staff lamented that the two-day national conference on the utilization of forest products failed to invite a single representative from the newspaper industry. So the forestry and, and print publishing and myriad forms have been entangled for a very long time, 
um, uh, but they don't often or always kind of uh, acknowledge the other's contributions to what they do. Meanwhile, actual living trees have been serving for millennia as stations for engraved or posted declarations and solicitations from I was here to we found your dog to want to learn yoga. Even when we harness the electromagnetic spectrum as a medium, plants continued to serve as communication resources. The sap of the gutta percha tree supplied the latex that insulated submarine telegraph cables. Trees yielded their trunks and succumbed to a wash in plant-based creosote in order to prop up proliferating wires. At street level, poles, which my colleague media scholar Lisa Gittleman describes as trees undone, constitute a continue to host a palimpsest of tacked on announcements and solicitations. We still see this to some degree on utility poles around the city, many of which are metal, but and especially if you go outside the city, you'll find that most of them are still kind of creosote poles, um, kind of a, a re reincarnation of the tree. Thoreau regarded those uh, poles as trees not undone, but ennobled. Quote, I put my ear to one of the posts, and it seemed to me as if every pore of the wood was filled with music as if every fiber was affected in being reasoned or, time, or seasoned or timed, rearranging according to a new and more harmonious law. How this wild tree from the forest, stripped of its bark and set up here, rejoices to transmit this music. So there was a lot of romanticization of the ether in the early days of kind of early telecommunications. People didn't quite understand the science of how it worked. So there was some understanding of it's a mix of science and magic which is kind of the vibe that permeates some of the way to uh, the Ray, um, kind of eulogizes, uh, celebrates the, t the humble telephone pole. And he rejoices it to transmit the music, which he calls the music of the telegraph harp. In addition to serving as telecommunications props and musical instruments and arboreal oracles, trees also served as transmitters themselves. During World War II, military innovators discovered that trees could act as nature's own wireless towers and antennae combined. While more portable and efficient technology ultimately replaced what's, what they call the fluorophone, similar setups are still used by jungle platoons and eco-artists. A few years ago, there was some speculation that we could simply spray trees with neocapacitors to turn them into full body antennae. That idea doesn't really seem to have taken root. Yet telecom companies continue to disguise some of their cell towers as palms and pines to enable them to blend not so elegantly, they're not really fooling anybody, into the suburban flora. As the ether fills with transmissions, however, trees have proven to be rather uncooperative ambient apparatus. Their leaves sometimes obstruct fragile 5G millimeter waves. Raindrops are also problematic for this. That means that super fast next generation wireless most likely won't reach a lot of rural areas not only because of intrusive greenery, but also because such tiny markets can't justify the implementation of dense small cell hardware installations. Environmental riches are sadly a liability in some rural communities on the wrong side of the digital divide. In Clear Fork, Tennessee, for instance, those who are connected mostly to the internet, that is, have slow, expensive satellite service that barely works in the summer when foliage is dense or when the weather is bad. In the absence of commercial internet service providers, local and national tech advocacy groups are working to build a community network for Clear Fork. Greta Byram, who's a graduate of urban planning here at Columbia and Everbusi, note that the valley's topography and vegetation necessitate a network architecture quite different from those we'd find in a city. So here is some of the topography, but also the degree of foliation that actually requires totally different logics of network building. Quote, high frequency, high bandwidth signals, like on the five gigahertz band and up, bounce around in the terrain, echoing off metal rooftops, disappearing into rises and haulers, and scattering among the foliage, they write. We'll explore lower, lower frequencies on the spectrum for Clear Fork Valley, testing the idea that networking here, like organizing, community organizing, is a slow and intrepid process, and that social and interpersonal networks will be the strongest base for any wireless enterprise. Or, as Jeff Manoff, any of you remember him, used to the voice of Building Blog, proposed, perhaps we'll have to design new arboreal terrains, new landscape architectures that are more conducive to signal traffic. Such optimized floral workflows ca could cost farm and, and forest laborers their jobs, just as the rise of digital communication has precipitated declines in postal mail. <laughs> 
In April of 2019, the Postal Service laid off 10,000 workers. And if you want to think about the history of the Postal Service, they're one of the major employers of especially workers of color. Um, lovers had stopped pr professing their adoration on scented stationery and instead sent texts or sects. Retailers stopped distributing massive holiday catalogs. Gifts replaced greeting cards. Um, offices have purportedly gone paperless. And many of the mills that once filled office copy machines and filing cabinets have closed. Fewer sentiments are expressed in declarations issued on thin sheets of wood pulp stuffed into envelopes sealed with plant-based gum and uh, excuse me, plant-based gum um, Arabic adhesive and cleared for delivery with a stamp. A tiny tag once made sticky by mixing alcohol and potato starch. So there's so many layers of using plants and just the act of like putting a letter in the mail. I don't know how many of us even do that anymore, but it was a, um, a fond, uh, uh, an important chapter of communication history. Yet we also see a resurgence of certain forms of paper-based communication in response to the ubiquity of digital technologies. Millennials and Gen Zers, I'm not sure what all of you are out there, um, are sending more artisanal greeting cards, supposedly. Letterpress has been reborn. Zines and chapbooks are the stars of popular print fairs. I don't know how many of you are maybe new to New York, new York for this program, but the New York Art Book Fair happens every, I think, October. Happen, it used to be at PS1, now I think it's moved back to DIA. Highly recommended, it's an amazing event. Um, and many niche publishers have focused on the book as a material object. You have Columbia, the, the architecture for the book, what is it? The imprint at Columbia University Press? Columbia Books on Architecture. Columbia Books on Architecture. And like a really vibrant printing tradition here. Um, as more and more commercial activity shifts from the exchange of paper money to plastic or electromagnetic um, uh, NFC or new fluid communication payment methods, shops are evolving in the opposite direction. Expanding on uh, expanding bands on paper bag, or excuse me, expanding bands on plastic bags increased demand for paper sacks and cloth totes. A recent report from Penn State suggests that new, stronger paper bags could be repeatedly reused than recycled for biofuel. Digital commerce is paradoxically bringing more brown paper mills back online, many under Chinese ownership, to manufacture not only paper bags but also cardboard boxes. Amazon and other online retailers have stretched our existing delivery networks and even created new logistics operations of their own, which has been the subject of several architectural studios that I had visited over the past several years, including Jesse LeCavalier, if any of you know his work, has done several studios on Amazon logistics um, for Cornell. And it's precipitated a dramatic increase in the use of container board. At the same time, these boxes have become harder to contain at a global infrastructural scale. 15 years ago, corrugated cardboard constituted 15% of America's recycling stream. Today, it's nearly half, and most of that waste is residential, which means it's typically mixed in with other contaminating household trash and food waste. And the question is, is this an architectural challenge? I mean, looking at things like waste streams, maybe that's an urban planning and design challenge also. Americans put plastic bags and chewing gum and bowling balls and dirty diapers, diapers, and everything else you can imagine into the recycling containers, David Biederman, executive director of the Solid Waste Association of North America, told The Verge. About 25 to 30 percent of all materials collected by recycling services are too contaminated to be processed. Even just a little cheese that falls onto the bottom of the pizza box renders it kind of unrecyclable. In 2018, China restricted imports of American recyclables, including mixed paper, which led some municipalities to send their paper waste to landfills or incinerators. Yet the ban has proven to be a boon for some communities with tattered paper industries, particularly those that now make boxes from cardboard scrap and are willing to do the dirty work of sorting salvageable container board from other detritus. Companies like Walmart and Amazon have implemented new sustainable packaging standards in an attempt to cut back on all the boxes and plastic air pillows used to package and ship, ship their goods. And even packaging, you could say, is maybe an architectural challenge. Like Diller and Scoof Video have done some projects about folding, and others have looked at kind of um, the box itself as an architectural object. The container ship, as in, uh, the container, um, uh, what do you call it? The container itself and the ship also is an architectural and planning challenge. Uh, but Amazon's initiative hasn't worked exactly as planned. It's instead spawned a new repackaging industry, wherein intermediary contractors unbox and then rebox goods from third-party sellers so they meet Amazon's logistical standards. As Josh Dezezi explains, quote, Amazon only accepts goods that are packaged a certain way, 
Products need to be made ready for the automated gauntlet of the fulfillment center. Again, the logics of the space that it has to be passed through to get to where it's going. Essentially, you have to backtrack, re-engineer the chain of all the things that are designed prior to it so that it fits the logics of that fulfillment center. Old barcodes and prices need to be covered up and new ones added. Glass needs to be bubble wrapped. Loose items need to be bagged. These reboxers who operate their, in their own small scale prep centers across the country, and especially in sales tax free zones, are an integral, if invisible, link in Amazon's logistical network. And that network runs on cardboard. At least it does now. Biodegradable starch-based biopolymers could compose many of our um, packaging materials, cups, straws, lids, utensils, plates, bottles, trash bags, labels, glues, and tapes. Scientists and entrepreneurs imagine that nanocellulose could be used to make, I think there's supposed to be an image here. There it is. Nanocellulose could be used to make everything from biofuels to body armor and could serve a variety of medicine, or sorry, medical functions, including wound dressing and bone regeneration. It's got new mediation applications too. Wood flour, it turns out, can be transformed into transparent paper that can be applied to electronic devices and solar cells. And lignin, which is found in plant cell walls, has been found to be an exceptionally rigid and rot-resistant 3D printing material. Again, these are all things that you will probably encounter in one way or another as part of your architectural or your design practice. As our supply chains and distribution channels have globalized, so have those for the pulp and paper industries. New centers of activity have emerged around the world, including especially in Brazil, again in China, and new sustainable, sustainable best practices have arrived with them. But those guidelines are not evenly applied throughout the industry. As more and more researchers and critics are monitoring the global environmental, social, political, and economic impacts of big tech and data-driven enterprises, we also need to recognize that paper, pulp, forestry, waste management, nan nanotech, and a host of other cellulose-infused fields are extensions of the platform economy. We need to host, hold, excuse me, hold those industries accountable and ourselves too, as we contemplate the branching implications of our digital and analog habits. So that was the most developed part. The rest are a bit more extemporized. That was the one big branch, the others are tinier branches, maybe more tenuous too. So trees as sites of communication or mediation. And some of these examples, again, will be familiar from the, from the article, but I have included some new stuff. So first we have trees that have site as served as sites for passionate and partisan deliberation. Many momentous decisions have been made under trees, under the shelter of trees. They've witnessed and even seeded the germination, hybridization, invasion, on occasion, destruction of peoples and nations. As told in the first pages of the Bible, it was Eve's choice to consume forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge that condemned humanity to sin, suffering, judgment, and death. We can see in myriad religious traditions how trees are places where the important shit gets done, where big decisions are made. Centuries ago, in what is now North America, the great peacemaker of the Iroquois and his disciple Hiawatha brought together leaders from various um, Native American nations to uh, the great treat of peace to sign treaties. And there are myriad examples of, um, and some maybe apocryphal, of important treaty making happening under people, where people gather at trees. And that might be in part because they're kind of gathering in border zones. And they're, as my arboreal law piece shows, like trees often serve as kind of important indices, things you can see on the landscape that would mark the, the, uh, the border of a person's property, the edge of a certain kind of political boundary. Um, another, yet another, the council oak, another place where kind of important political things are happening. We also have the importance of trees, um, uh, you know, some interesting research on street trees, uh, but especially if we look in kind of like New England towns, we see the importance of the elm as a civic symbol and as a place where important civic activities happen, parades, town discussions, um, town halls, things of that sort, where political candidates will give literal stump speeches on stumps. And then we also have kind of a darker side of this tradition where we have witness trees, where people have meted out un, uh, kind of unjust justice um, throughout the histories of racial segregation. And uh, several trees, especially throughout the South, but also into the North, have been marked as witness trees, trees that essentially bear witness to the atrocities that happened on and under their branches. 
You probably also read in the piece about um, uh, various elders gathering in Somalia under, uh, in, the, in accordance with the custom of uh, the customary legal system. In Slovenia, people gathering under linden trees. In Africa and Asia, the baobab tree being a place where a lot of like civic activity happens, where discussions happen, where uh, ideas are exchanged. Um, another interesting example is the mangrove, the mangrove school, which provides um, in Guinea-Bissau shelter for guerrilla education. Um, we might also want to think about what it is specifically about the mangrove as a species of tree, the specific morphology, the fact that it kind of bridges land and sea and has these very entangled roots, roots that actually make it a great space for hiding out, for performing guerrilla activities, um, and to consider if it actually mediates the types of social relations that happen within its roots. There are also, um, continuing with this idea of trees as sites for communication, uh, this documentary by Rita Leisner called Forest for the Trees, where she follows um, uh, Western Cana or West Coast tree planting campaigns. So it's just a documentary following a group of probably early 20-somethings who were spending a summer planting trees and the camaraderie and communication that happens in between them. It's a slightly romantic kind of presentation of the whole tree planting enterprise, but again, it shows not just the tree, individual tree itself, but the whole apparatus of planting trees to, to remediate deforestation as a way to build um, kind of connections between people and build friendships. Uh, there's also in Philadelphia, and I'm excited to get to work with these or to learn more about these folks, a public art project called Street Work, and that's a pun with the tree actually put in parentheses in the middle of street work, uh, which aims to animate how we live among trees, how we perceive them, and how we imagine our future um, co-inhabitation, or cohabitation that is. And then also I would like to think about trees as sites for communication that go beyond the human. Here, we can look at something like the nurse log, which is a fallen tree in a forest that actually serves as a site for the generation of an entire ground level new ecosystem and for interspecies communication. So, think, so, it's, so trees as sites for communication that go beyond just that to serve kind of human beings as well. The next branch might be trees as epistemological models. And again, some of the first of these will be recognizable from the article. So we have a long history of trees of knowledge being used again in multiple cultural or religious traditions, trees being a way of organizing how we organize thoughts into categories, how we classify things, how we kind of break up an entire um, knowledge landscape into disciplines. We also have the persistence of a lot of tree forms, even in computational thinking through things like decision trees, random forests, other algorithms that really still follow that kind of branching or rooted form in um, uh, the way decisions are made computationally. I'd also want to think too about like, the history of sylvan scripts. There's a designer named Katie Holden who's written several books about the language of trees and especially looked at kind of ancient Irish uh, tree-based scripts where um, uh, these are in some cases carved on trees themselves, but you can see there's a real kind of arboreal or dendrological form to some of the letter forms here and how that drawing on the tree as a model, a conceptual model might shape the th types of things that are communicable in these uh, written languages or writing systems. I'd also want to look at things like indigenous maps, some of which um, some some of which communities use things like driftwood and other wood forms to um, uh, map out the terrain, the contours of a coastline, for instance, and what it means to think about topography in wooden form and how that maybe shapes the way that these two material forms inform one another. And then the final example, this is a former uh, TA of mine uh, who was graduated from Parsons Des um, Transdisciplinary Design Project, who's been doing a project for many years called Becoming Tree. So you might have seen the example, I'm forgetting his name, the guy who did the Build Your Own Toaster project, who also did the I'm going to, I, uh, being goat, he, he pretend, he, I don't want to minimize his work by saying he pretended to be a goat, but he acted as a goat to understand what it's like to be another species. Jonas is maybe drawing some inspiration from that to see about what if we draw from the modes of perception, the forms of the, the physical forms, uh, the, um, the rootedness, the morphologies of trees and how that might inform the way we experience our everyday lives. Now we could even see, especially on hot days in the city, that our bodies are drawn to or repelled by trees in different ways, especially on hot days. We move to where there is shade cast onto the street. So there are ways that trees are already kind of informing our comportment in a built landscape. The next to last branch would be trees as sources of data. 
And here we could look at things like the whole history of field guides. I wish I could have found some more historical examples from a couple hundred years ago to give you a greater historical scope here. But just to see what type of data, how people have turned trees into empirical data that will help aid in their classification identification. So here are just the datification of trees in different formal, chromatic, textural ways to aid in our understanding or identifying what they are. And of course, um, uh, I wrote a piece, not, not of course, the of course was misplaced. Like, you probably don't know this, but I wrote a piece a couple years ago looking at the whole history of field guides and how they're often used, especially in new digital landscapes. Um, we don't, people don't understand how the internet works or how Wi-Fi operates. So a lot of artists and designers in particular have adopted the, the field guide form to help people understand these really messy infrastructures and complex digital systems. Another way that trees serve as data would be, as you probably know, tree rings, um, which uh, Jim Robbins describes as giant organic recording devices that contain information about past climate, civilizations, ecosystems, and even um, galactic events. Much of that data um, is translated from arboreal to dig digital form and shared in the International Tree Ring Data Bank. And this is just more example. This is a really great book about uh, tree ring science um, by Valerie Chouet. A contrary example uh, is the xylotech or xylaria, which uh, hosts collections of preserved plant specimens. Each volume is a box made of a particular species wood. Its spine is covered with the corresponding bark, and its sides are composed with various tree cuts, horizontal slices of branches, cross sections of trunk, samples of sapwood, mature wood, heartwood. Inside, you'd find an assortment of anatomical parts, seed capsules, roots, leaves, buds, flowers, and wax models of its fruit. Annotations noted its properties, its habitat, preferred soils, and use. So this itself is a way of like not just thinking of data as something digital on a screen. Each of these is a datum that's included in a box that is kind of like a, rep a data repository in a way. If you think across disciplines, data constitutes so many different things. I'm not trained as an anthropologist, but I was in an anthropology department for the past four years. There, just think about how field work yields the cultivation of just even interview um, transcripts, for instance, or uh, ephemera one picks up in the field. These actually constitute data. Data does not have to be, data do not have to be digital. Another way the tree becomes sources of data is in the whole world of algorithmic botany, which has resonances in computer science and the arts. There was actually, a, some of you might know, the School for Poetic Computation, which is down in the West Beth, uh, down in West Beth. Um, they had, a, just a couple months ago, a class, a whole class on algorithmic botany, where people are exploring patterns in nature and distilling plants down to the very basic morphological forms that define what it means to be a tree and then also exploring the fractal nature of tree growth and whether um, that might have some implications for forestry, for instance, or botany. Um, so you can see there's actually an article in forestry looking kind of fractals in tree crowns, for instance. So the, all the myriad multidisciplinary applications of algorithmic botany, again, is another manifestation of trees as data. And then if we scale up, we could look at the challenges of mapping trees and forests as explored by this really great article from Cindy Lynn a couple years ago in Eflux Architecture about how to make a forest. All the really political, subjective decisions about where to put a point on a map of a forest, considering data are not objective manifestations of, of an external truth. They're actually driven by nationalist enterprises, by subjective choices, aesthetic choices. Really great article looking at how complicated mapping really is and forests and when they're contested in particular. Some of you might also know the work of Bobby Petrushko, who's a landscape architect, used to be at the GSD and now just came to Penn last year. He does a lot of great work look, using really GIS and mapping as an art form to show all the different visual technologies, sensor technologies, the complicated and beautiful ways that we can map forests. Again, to show how complicated it actually is to determine what constitutes a forest. The final section, and this is short, is the tree is a communicative network. So there has been, and I'm sure you've heard of this, uh, a lot of talk in recent years of the distinctive fungal or floral intelligences. Scientists have learned that trees respond to a host of stimuli, energy resources, they respond to light, obviously, minerals and water, to mechanical stimuli, to touch, um, to soil structure, humidity, temperature, atmospheric gas composition, and various biotic signals, including even the presence or absence of nearby plants, predators, or diseases. 
Plants can remember particular stresses like drought or extreme temperature or exposure to radiation. And they've evolved their own means of interspecies communication. Again, I'm not sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know here. You've undoubtedly heard of the Widewood Web, um, an underground network of myc mycorrhizal fungi that connects the roots of plants and trees, transferring water, carbon, and nutrients, sending chemical warnings of attack, and either nurturing desirable neighbors or sabotaging invasive species. Invasive neighbors, that is. Chemical, hormonal, and electrical signals serve as communication media and an organic mesh network, in a way we could call the, this whole, this whole um, fungal system. I also want to think about how trees draw pollinators and other doulas, like squirrels, into their networks, connecting senders and receivers and delivering seeds, and how they serve as a networked medium of communication for others, for other species, that is. Like with bears, you know, leaving marks of their scent on the tree as a substrate. The tree is a medium for them to mark their territory. In addition, I'd like to consider how trees withdraw, how they might refuse communication. I'm wondering if there are any trees that we could say are actually asocial. They don't want to interact with other people and what that might mean. Especially if a tree kind of, this is, I'm anthropomorphizing it, but some of the more romantic tree communication books I've read essentially describe it as a tree knows it's dying, so it kind of cuts itself off from others so that it's not extracting nutrients and resources that it should be giving to the next generation. Again, that sounds very human-like, ascribing all this benevolent agency to the tree, but it's a, it's a story about it, kind of what's capping, happening chemically. Um, perhaps some of the historical and contemporary AI-infused work on forest soundscapes can also shed some light or rather cast an ear on these interspecies ecologies, prompting us to consider what we can learn not only through our other senses, but also through other communication signals that might escape our humanly realm of perception. So there's um, some, an interesting EU-wide project going on right now between foresters and digital humanists looking at how you can map, capture and map um, forest scapes. Um, well, I'm not sure it's appropriate to say that these floral and faunal communication networks are governed. It is helpful to think about, how gov about governance when we imagine how these arboreal and botanical systems can serve as models for human-made communication networks. As we see in Tika Brain's work, some of you might know, she teaches at NYU in the, I forget what the program's called, in Tandon, in this engineering school. A lot of work combining um, uh, 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 organic things, botany, and, and um, technology, sorry, and um, kind of creative tech. And also the various projects that existed in the wet networks exhibit at the Queens Museum, seeing how we can learn from the root structures, the forms of leaves from various species of plants, and how they might um, teach us something about how we could actually build technological networks. You probably have heard that you know if we, we were to look at a map of an efficiently designed transit system, it maps onto the route that a slime mold would have followed throughout uh, on, on a map of that same terrain. So here, maybe there's something we can learn from kind of tree-based morphologies as well and planning not just communication networks, but other forms of infrastructures, which again is a planning and maybe an architectural challenge also. So here we're getting at the end. Trees are media, both immediate and ancient, ephemeral and endlessly enduring. They're rooted in our material world, archiving its geologic and climatic pasts, and branching toward different potential futures. Their survival and ours requires that we think about how our digital worlds are built in part on sylvan resources, how our need for speed and efficiency and ubiquitous connectivity comes at sometimes at the expense of leaves and weeds. Our cords and cables are entangled with roots and vines, however wirelessly ungrounded we might imagine ourselves to be. But I also want to wonder what implications these various projects I just shared with you might have for urban and architectural design, perhaps for the engineering of infrastructures or the programming, sorry, programming of social spaces. I hope that each of the branches we followed here evoke some potential design applications, and I hope we can discuss some of those in the discussion afterwards. I'm still searching for how to connect these various branches back to a rhetorical trunk of some sort to write hopefully a book about this, to consider what it is about trees that lend themselves to mediation, their verticality, their rootedness, their fractal morphology, and how those qualities facilitate various forms of communication, inscription, broadcast, digital transmission, through nodes and lines, buds and leaves and branches, and meshy roots. So, thank you.
Um, thank you for that wonderful talk. I learned so much about trees. Um, <laughs> and I will never see them in the same way again. Um, kind of building upon something you uh, touched on in your talk, um, you talked about uh, writing from the me, right? Who we are and where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we've seen this in other disciplines and as well, uh, thinking about auto theory or auto history. Um, and in your book, which you know we didn't read for uh, in preparation for this event, uh, but when you're talking about uh, dashboards as you know subversive interfaces, um, you talk about uh, critical interfaces that introduce productive frictions or meaningful inefficiencies that prompted their users to slow down. Um, so how do you do what you do? Um, and how, can you say a little bit more about your methods and how you know, the slowness and friction uh, comes in, uh, how, you, how you prepare your objects and subjects for research? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so, um, being interdisciplinary is a challenge. It kind of creates, uh, if anybody has any aspirations for an academic career, uh, advisors will probably tell you it's very dangerous to explicitly define yourself as an interdisciplinary person because you're gonna be held to the standards of the multiple fields you're trying to cross. So it does create additional obligations because you have to read really deeply and talk to people across those different fields. So that's one way that actually requires me to slow down and to actually do a lot more reading than I would have if I were I will say, and I, I realize this isn't cone of silence because this is being recorded and it's gonna be placed online at some point, but one thing I found when I was in an anthropology department for a few years is I would sometimes review manuscripts or read things for potential use in class and I would find that anthropologists would sometimes write about I don't know, a, a city, uh, kind of a, a park in a city, or a particular design experience. Not really acknowledging that actually there are architects who write about, critically about what they do. There's a whole theory within the field itself. There's a discourse, there are publications in those fields. So there are plenty of people in various disciplines in the academy who really only read the journals in their field. And sure, you can, that's a maybe valid, valuable knowledge to people within that field. They're still making a contribution. I just find it really, frustrating reading those types of things because I, I think that their work could actually be much improved and more valuable if you actually sh um, saw what your field has to offer in dialogue with the other people who actually have some domain expertise in the things that you're writing about. So that's one way, like choosing to be interdisciplinary and like essentially assigning, my, assigning myself a much heavier reading list and a water swath of field work. Um, I'd also say, um, yeah, the difficulty of these past two years, which I think you and I talked about, I've talked about with everybody, the fact that some people feel like they're just coming out of a long period of lethargy, I realize long COVID is a thing, it actually compelled a bit of slowing down. Uh, moving to a new job, I thought I was just gonna power through and try to keep up all the things I promised to people while also transitioning to a new city and job. But I ultimately realized that um, uh, learning a new landscape, figuring out what actual spatial and community resources are there, and finding think thought partners in those places isn't something you can just drop in or helicopter in. That is requires a slow building of relationships and trust. Taking walk, this is going to sound like, I don't mean this for this to sound juvenile or pedantic or, or, or um, infantilizing, but um, there was also a tweet that went around a couple days ago of a, of a prize winning novelist who was saying that when he was in grad school, somebody cornered him at a party and wonder why he's not, why he's so prolific. And he said, that's because this was the first and only party I'd gone to throughout my entire grad school experience. And I realized right then that I would never go to another one because my secret to productivity is not going to parties, not socializing. It sparked a whole debate online, um, uh, not terribly profound, but I realized like how talking to people, hanging out with people, going to see art, taking walks, being surprised by the notices I see posted on a telephone pole. You know, it was one of the examples I used here, but I have uh, thought of, I mean, several moments of epiphany have come to me over the years by just actually reading the stickers on a telephone pole or learning about interesting events that you're not gonna find on social media that are just posted with a little tear off tag on a utility pole or a community message board in a food co-op, for instance. So these types of like being open to research data wherever it presents itself to you in your ambient and quotidian environments. I mean, that's, that's another thing. Um, 
uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, no, no I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And also the point that you raised about thinking with community, right? Thinking mm -hmm. with, with other people, um, and sometimes those people are trees. Yes, yeah. Um, I will pass the mic on. Yes, um, thank you as well for the uh, dense presentation today. It was very interesting. Um, I must say, we, we do know the text on uh, plowing the field. Uh, we, uh, when working with students, we always ask them to kind of make a field guide at a certain oh, point. Nice. Also, uh, students, some students who rest here today have read the text as a starting point and make this field guide. Um, so so I, I kind of see the lecture also as kind of an extended field guide with many examples of different trees um, being, you know, more related to cultural, uh, technological cultivation of all. Uh, and natural or artificial artifacts. And um, I think that we often um, see these as opposites, uh, or this has been seen as the natural versus the artificial. But in a way, I think we're more interested. Also, oh, I think we can't hear you, so you should speak sorry? closer to the mic. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so uh, I think uh, rather as looking at them as opposites, I think we're more interested in, in the, where they meet each other and. Uh, Kind of messy hybrids. Uh, it was one example, or I maybe wanted to add this: the idea of um, Google Maps. On the one hand, is kind of a data tree, a quad tree structure behind it, uh, but it also captures nature in a very strange form, as Google Trees, as kind of an mm -hmm. accidental um, hybrid that comes mm -hmm. out of it. Um, you mentioned the example of uh, the tree of life, uh, also in your text, uh, seeing trees as antennas versus uh, antennas disguised as trees, this kind of friction there, or con connection, um, and also the Tega Link project in that sense. So um, I think as, as architects often still see uh, nature as, uh, or in trees as cat blocks without roots and PNGs to, to, to be photoshopped and kind of make a cuteness out of nature. Um, uh, I do think there are also practices that start to look at uh, these uh, interesting hybrids, encounters. We, we had uh, a lecture of Yigami uh, last week that to some extent does this. Uh, I'm thinking of Bob Botanik, who does this a practice in Germany. Um, so, so I think in my question is maybe also a more general question. <laughs> uh, we are very much interested in, in the studio and work with students in this kind of uh, hybrids and this kind of encounters, we, th we think we think of it as a possible answer to not thinking in this opposite as architects often do, uh, and 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 look for more, um, yeah, uh, you say connection between those two. Uh, so how do you think we, we as as architects come? Do you think this can help us to better understand certain? Um, uh, complexities of our contemporary times and entanglements and shifts, and, and how do you think as architects we can co become better at this? Um, what kind of um, possibilities are there maybe also in the, in the media and media ecologies that our technologies bring forward and how they kind of show different perspectives on certain aspects as, as you clearly did today. Um, so yeah, this, this will be my question. Thanks, thank you. So if any of you are following the chat GPT discussion that has just kind of been spinning out of control since last November, I think, when it was released, there are all these discussions about um, fear of displacement, fear of mass layoffs, um, uh, machines supplanting entire professions. Um, but then there's a, typically this, the pendulum swings back down to a more moderate position at some point. And Tung Hui Hu, I'm not sure if any of you know the media scholar, published, I think it was probably also on EFLUX last week, about arguing that we should instead and this is not novel, it's just that eventually we have to get all of the, the fatalism, the, the panic out of our system before we come back to hopefully a more moderate understanding of things. Most things are a hybrid, most things are a balance. Mm -hmm. So where can we actually find ways where computers or, or, or um, large language models, for instance, can enhance or provide ethical, and that's another consideration, rather, you know, a lot of the prog prognostications of mass layoffs, for instance, are not really thinking about the, the social implications of releasing a new technology into the world. 
but what are actual ethical uh, and exciting and generative collaborations between humans and machines? This is something people have been asking for, um, I don't know, since the, the Luddites, the arts and crafts movement. I mean, these are not new questions, just we keep forgetting that we've asked them before, and every time a new technology comes out, mm -hmm. um, there's this all or nothing mentality, um, but then hopefully the, the kind of the more balanced hybrid, hybrid considerations come into being. Mm -hmm. So. I would encourage you to read the piece. Again, it's freely available on, I think it's a, a Flux Architecture Tongue We Use piece from last week, encouraging us to think about what writers, creative practitioners, designers, how we can ensure that people are still employed, that they're just uniquely, I don't want to be human essentialist here, but the things that humans are actually really good at can be working in productive tension and collaboration with a technology that can help them do their jobs better and more efficiently, not more efficiently, more ethically, more equitably, all these types, whatever value system you want to define your practice. And then another more concrete example is I've been working with my first dissertation I wrote about Rem Kulhas' Seattle Public Library. I went while they were designing the, the building and, and wanted to see what a new library building would look like in a city that had just put itself on the global map um, because of Microsoft and Amazon in an era when those very institutions were supposed to render the whole, the whole um, those very corporations were supposed to render the whole institution of the library irrelevant and ob to obviate its existence. Um, so that was a really interesting project because it actually got at this, we need actually something hybrid rather mm -hmm. than assuming that some the new, this will kill that, to go back to Victor Hugo, the book will kill the building. Um, but libraries have, I think, not done a great job, but done a great of, of, of um, executing, but done a great job of thinking about how the digital and the physical could and should inform one another, especially because it's supposed to be an institution that is free to all, useful to everybody, and you want period people to have myriad ways of actually finding out about it, engaging with it. So how do you design interfaces, uh, catalogs, kiosks, touch screens, um, paper-based materials, um, uh, public art installations that actually provide an entry point for people with various literacies, interests, and then helps them to understand how the physical facility itself works and vice versa. How can you have the digital and the, how can you form a form, create a form of interoperability in a way between digital infrastructures and physical spaces? So just because I've worked with, I'm a president board of the New York Library, Count, the New York Metropolitan Library Council, have worked with a bunch of the libraries here in the city on different design projects over the years. So this is a theme that comes up repeatedly, especially if you're dealing with a project that maybe has a small floor print, a limited budget, poorly maintained, where can you do what you can with the resources you have and then use technology to supplement where the physical space actually falls so or short. So that you can, how do they work with all the limitations, the conditionals of a design process? How can you, again, find those affordances of what the digital does well, different forms of digitality, and what various physical, furniture, lighting, uh, 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 um, car floor, floor treatments, wind fenestration, um, any type of design consideration. So all of these are different kind of variables you have at your disposal to sit, figure out how the digital and the physical can support one another, whatever your kind of larger public mission might be. Okay. You see that in the classroom too. I don't know that we've done that terribly well during the pandemic, but mm -hmm. the attempt was, especially as we moved back into physical space, to try to take what we've learned about digital tools during the pandemic era and have them enhance your experience in the live gathering. I am not sure if we've really done that terribly well, but those are lessons we should have learned. No, I, I think mm -hmm. to some degree, we probably all did, mm -hmm. kind of um, included some tools from the pandemic in our post-pandemic uh, teaching, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I graft something onto that? Sure. Uh, <laughs> and ask you about, is that what you mean by grafting as method? I've heard you speak about it, and um, I think it would be really useful for everyone to hear what you mean by that. And also, relatedly, uh, you know, with data, there's the idea of creating the hyper-real, right, which doesn't really exist. Uh, so is there, you know, equivalent to that, is there like a hyper-natural, what does that mean? Is it important? Is that what grafting does? Uh. That's a great question. So what is grafting? I mean, that was a metaphor I used. Um, I was invited to write for, a lot of my projects come from somebody giving me a prompt. Um, I, if, if somebody asked me to give a talk, I actually asked Andres, like, what would you like me to talk about? Because if you give me a tabula rasa, it's paralyzing. I'm like, 
I need you to give me a keyword. I want to know like where I could fill a gap in the speaker series or what are students interested in and where can what I think I can do well match up to what they're interested in. So having those, it's the same thing, like having some design limitations or parameters is often generative in many cases. So I was given the task of writing about grafting for this exhibition up in Toronto five or six years ago. It wasn't something I'd thought about before, but they wanted me to write about smart cities in relation to grafting. Like, what do these have to do with one another? And then I realized that one of the challenges of a lot of tabula rasa smart city development, where you take often, I realized that, you know, there's that book, Deserts Are Not Empty, that was published recently, Deserts Are Not Empty Spaces, but one of the tropes was that you take an empty desert space, a, a, a brown field or something, a post-industrial zone, and you plop a new city on it without having to care about what was there before. There's always something there before. It might have just been pushed far underground, repressed in the memory, trauma kind of pushed under a rock, for instance. Probably species and people haven't been displaced. So just frustrations with the tabula rasa. This is a very modernist, you know, kind of um, a, a grand scale planning way of thinking too. So just frustrations with thinking about that and that mentality with smart cities, realizing that instead, rather than just imposing your really super smart digital intelligence onto a community, why don't you do an inventory of what types of intelligences are already there in the, 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 the brains and bodies of the people who live there, in their vernacular architectural traditions, in the trees where they gather, the parks they love, the desire paths they've carved through certain areas. So these are um, anal um, analog, accidental, ambient forms of intelligence that you can then more responsibly graft your digital tools onto in a way that doesn't dishonor the, un the, the wisdom that's already there. So that was where I thought, like, that's where actually this productive, you gave me this assignment and now this we gave me this really productive opportunity to think about how these two terms relate to each other. And then I realized it was a good metaphor because this, I was actually a little nervous about writing this book, The City is Not a Computer, because most of it is drawn from pieces, as you had mentioned, I mostly publish my work in open access venues. I write mostly for Places Journal, which is a public scholarship venue rather than writing for mostly peer reviewed journals that require you to pay $100 to rent an article for a day or 10,000 to own that article. Um, I'm slightly exaggerating. I wanted to, I try to prioritize openly accessible venues. Um, just because I write about libraries, which are all about making knowledge accessible, I should actually live that in my practice too. Um, but this book was drawn on pieces that were already out there in the world, freely accessible. I was like, why does that need to be a book? Um, I was invited to turn it into a book. And then people, I asked on Twitter, people said like, a book is a different reading experience than online. You can add new material. You can uh, put the different independent projects in relation to each other in a way that they can speak to each other in a way that you wouldn't find if they were atomized um, kind of blog posts or something. So I started to think about grafting again. Mm -hmm. There are so many different traditions to grafting. You can go to industrial economy, industrial agriculture, where it's just like a efficient science. It's all about engineering productivity. No care, of, not minimal care for kind of the health of the tree or the quality of the fruit it produces, just about how can we get volume. And then there are other traditions where grafting is a craft. It's like bonsai, kind of, or um, really knowing and communing with the thing that you're, gra the, the different identities of things you're grafting together. And that's what I wanted to do, the more the latter than the former. So I thought about um, grafting this understanding of urban development itself as a grafting practice to deal with what new you're adding and how to responsibly put it in relation to what's already there and then how to turn that into a book where I'm taking all these individual pieces I've done, grafting on a bunch of new stuff and finding ways to make the whole kind of a healthier, more vibrant uh, than the sum of its parts. I love that and um, you know I've, I've seen it happen in the book where uh, you know, you reference something in a later chapter and you'll say in chapter two, and it's a different, uh, you add a different nuance. So there's a true thread, the chapters speak to one another. Um, okay, with that, I think we should, we should open um, the floor to questions. I have one back there. It's not on. Okay, now you ah, can hear yes. me. So you mentioned in your article, Tree Thinking, there is this tension between uh, objectification of trees and versus maybe romanticizing 
over romanticizing trees. Uh, how how do you how do you think tree thinking fit fit into these two polar opposites? Like, uh, for example, Microsoft or Google are looking at uh, trees as uh, single data points, or you know, object objectifying trees as an organism, or you know, a, as a data point basically, versus the the example that you mentioned about you know looking at the tree as a living thing it's dying it's disconnecting from other uh, other trees to you know uh, to not uh, yeah uh, I guess the question is uh, where does tree thinking lies between these two polar opposites and should we why don't we for example tell Google to do Google like they're good with collecting data for example. Let them collect data. Let the artist be the artist, and he, he can represent the tree as a living uh, in, uh, you know, representation, for example. That's a good point. I think it also goes back to the hybridity question, like the, the, the maybe the more responsible, um, keep using that adjective, uh, richer, more productive, more, more useful, more hopefully enriching for the people who are doing the work and the people who will be the ben hopefully the beneficiaries of it. Um, w is a product of hybridity. Um, and there, I think, uh, um, this is where, for example, you could, this is something that social scientists talk about often. We have also gone beyond, I think, moved beyond our fetishization of big data-based approaches mm -hmm. to realize that there's certain things that kind of mega, mega scale data, text mining, that type of stuff can offer, um, and then how you can supplement that with maybe slower, more qualitative methods. So um, there was a piece that, that circulated a few years ago called Supplementing Big Data with Thick Data. This is a reference to the anthropological concept of thick description, where you actually sit somewhere and write deep notes based on really intense observation. So this is where maybe like a Google map of trees, for instance, like the street, tour, a street equity index or the street equity index that I showed you, could help to provide a visualization of where the areas of immediate need are or most intense inequity. And then that's when you can supplement with people who actually know the community, who've done the slow work of actually building connections. So I feel like there's really productive ways that we can supplement data-driven methodologies to help point our, uh, direct our attention to particular and particular ways, and then combine that with maybe smaller scale, slower, more qualitative methods. Those methods are not necessarily analog or old school. You can still use really interesting kind of new technologies. As I mentioned, Jennifer Grease's work in citizen science, where they're both supplementing, you know, big corporate mapping projects that help to direct their attention to certain areas. And then they go in and they apply ethnography. They use kind of citizen science, sensors in various ways. So even using technology can help a community better understand its own interests, its own expertise, its own needs. So it's not to say that one is analog and one is digital. I feel like there are productive ways that both the corporate macro scale and the local micro scale can be both analog and digital, can use tools in responsible ways. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, the, the one danger of letting Google do what it does and letting the artists do what they do is sometimes if you let the technologists who maybe are not engaged with what activists, uh, marginalized communities, artists, actually how they actually want to use their work, you build software that doesn't serve the end user very well or is actually extractive or exploitative towards its potential future end users. Um, I make jokes with my colleagues all the time about how terrible most university enterprise software is. I'm sure you all know like Canvas and Blackboard and things of that sort. You should see the crap that we have to deal with as faculty to like put in receipts or order books or book classrooms. They're terrible. They're built by people who probably don't actually have to do that work. Realizing that the booking of a classroom is not pure logistics. It's based on pedagogy. It's based on how you teach determines how much night light you need, what type of acoustics are necessary. These are things that are not built into the software. Um, so this is where I feel like even, sure, you can maybe let them at some point go off and do their own thing, but even in the establishing of the basic parameters of how the software is designed, what the data model is, for instance, what the user experience is, this is where I feel like some cross-pollination, to go to another botanical metaphor here, is actually really useful. Uh, as at the various stages in each of these realms of expertise go about their work. Mm. Thank you. I'd like to thank you first for your interdisciplinary approach. Uh, 
and you're pre and for presenting the, this extensive body of knowledge, uh, I believe it applies to all of us, and it's almost like music to my ears. So th there is undeniable evidence to warrant the influence of trees on the development of humankind. Recent findings in regards to arboreal, fungal, and flora intelligences, as well as interspecies communication, need to be comprehended by humans so as to allow a production of knowledge rooted in cooperative thinking as opposed to models of dominance. Uh, you've stated this. Um, but the, the anthroposophic uh, movement pioneered by Rudolf Steiner in the 50s uh, has enabled organic and biodynamic agricultural models to serve as alternative farming techniques that nur nurture the biodynamic cycle in a farm and link organic uh, compost production from limited cattle reserves with uh, monitored cosmic forces and plant life cycles. Uh, I, I'm curious to ask, how do you see these active solutions and other passive solutions such as the Fukuoka, Fukuoka method and um, as feasible solutions to balance growing consumption demands of, global of the global population with sustainable uh, agricultural and forest uh, practices? And also, um, can you please elaborate as to how large metropolitan areas can meaningfully answer the global question of climate change without displaying arboreal <laughs> smoke screens. Did uh, you say the last part of that question, how cities can meaningfully address the question of climate change was the last part? Yes. Yes, uh, I mean, you stated the grafting technique that you used in Canada, but how can cities me meaningfully uh, answer uh, global climate change? Also, we've we talked this morning as to how New York City um, uh, specifically works on existing trees planted in the city and associates a certain monetary value to trees um, that are planted in New York City. How, how do you see uh, the interaction of cities and forests and also farms in an ecosystem that, that we are working on? That's Thank great. you. Those are, thank you for your kind words. Those are very big questions. Um, the anthropos anthrop anthroposophic m movement is something I really want to learn more about. I had mentioned going to the um, um, Warden Eshrick uh, home. That was one of the stops we took with my dad, the guy who lives in the, the house that looks kind of like a tree house, was very much informed by Steiner. Steiner. So that's, um, so I'm just mentioning it because it was something that came up again relatively recently, and I realized I have to learn more about it. But I think that uh, that community, even the Luddites, we use Luddite as a pejorative. It means somebody who's like afraid of or resistant to new things, but that's not the case at all. It's a principled choice of when you're going to use something or a principled refusal to use something, but does it doesn't actually fit your values, or you think it's not gonna be useful because, um, I don't know, it's a corporate imposition or a uh, state imposition rather than actually something that, uh, for which an organic need has arisen. So, um, uh, learning from the Luddites, learning from anthroposophists, uh, learning from various um, other communities. I'm trying to, um, you know, there's lots of work recently learning from um, forest management from indigenous communities, for instance, um, learning from uh, trees as data sources and all these other organic and um, uh, looking at the trees, corals, sediment samples as repositories to let us know how our predecessors managed forests as well. There's probably a lot to learn from there. I'm not an expert in uh, Steiner. It's someone I want, definitely want to learn more about as I continue with this project. But I guess all this to say that we should graft those on to kind of our repository of things and communities and practices we're learning from in how to create a productive form of hybridity, of bridging um, the, the um, analog and the digital, uh, the uh, legacy practices and innovation. I'll give you two more examples now that I'm, I'm kind of talking myself into some more examples. Um, this, the uh, shakers are also really interesting. Uh, I used to live up in Hudson, before, in, which is again two hours north of the city before moving to Philadelphia. And they have a, building a new museum in Chatham, which prompted me to write a piece for Art in America about the Annabelle Seldorf's design for the new museum. Um, but just learning more about them, they, we, we, often there's an equation of this, the shakers with the Amish. I grew up surrounded by Amish people, who many of whom do reject technology out of principle. Um, the Shakers were actually enthusiastic adopters of technology when it served their ethical and spiritual principles. 
So that's another community to, ver to learn from. They were communist capitalists. They kind of found a way to produce this really weird hybrid of being all about communism on the inside, capitalism with the outside world to fund their communist um, uh, kind of uh, communities on the inside. Um, another example that I just slipped my head, the Shakers, and then um, I'll try to think of the other one. Um, and then the cities and climate change, and that's the perennial million dollar question. I'm not sure I can answer that. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say that I know that um, Elise and Mario sitting in the front here taught a class on forests. I forget where it was a couple years ago. Uh, oh yes, yeah, something at the Bartlett. So I imagine you have kind of expertise of people teaching whole studios about forests who might be able to answer those questions. But I think also just a more regional sensibility to realize that kind of town and country, this is not no novel either, but to realize that there's not kind of a hard line separating town and country, that so much of what powers a city, that makes it operate, that provides social infrastructures, are the forests that are just beyond its official political borders. I mean, even the pandemic showed how hiking just exploded in popularity because people needed for, um, proximate forests for mental release. Forests, both proximate and far away, provide the building materials for like tall timber construction, for instance. They're burned for the fossil fuels we use to heat and cool our apartments. So just recognizing all of these flows in multiple directions that are promoted by kind of a more regional way of thinking is one way to realize that cities are codependent on uh, not in a psychoanalytic way, but like bi-directional dependence um, way on forests. That's probably the best I can offer it and extemporaneously here. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for your um, amazing multi-directional and um, super fast and enriching uh, experience of your talk. Um, I have a, a two questions. The first one is whether, um, how are you dealing in your book with, um, if so, with uh, hyper-romanticization of the tree um, as something that is always good and fantastic? Because of, of trees being like um, the, um, most beloved <laughs> uh, entities of um, botany, and yet they take lots of the credit that other species do. Um, and, and I'm saying this um, in addition to the hyper-greenification that you talked about uh, that is part of neoliberal culture, but more in relation to trees themselves, like how they become an ideal of so many different things and, and whether they're always good. I was at a, at a workshop recently, interdisciplinary and whatnot, and on trees and climate change, and, and, and I asked, but are trees always good? And people were looking at me like, well, yeah, of course. Like, I was like, well, but it depends, no? Sometimes, um, I don't know, gentrification, and they were like, yeah, but, but that's not our bit. Like, so, um, just to get an understanding of, of um, how you're dealing with that in, in, in your book. And then the other one is methodological maybe, and I think my, my, my feeling is that you have so much uh, material that <laughs> I wonder how you're distinguishing between the one tree and many trees. Because once we are dealing with the many, and forests, but not only, but maybe parks, etc. Once we deal with the many, we, we get into the um, more visible, let's say, social political questions, the politics of the collective, etc. cetera. Um, so, and it makes projects more situated. So I was wondering if you're making that distinction at all and whether you could write two books, one for the individual tree, <laughs> the single tree, and the other one for, for trees in, in common, because I honestly think that there are different beasts. And if we think about forests, for example, again, many of the, of the um, attributes that we assign to forests are performed by like ugly small plants uh, or animals. Or, so they take, they take all the credit. And, and maybe it would be fun or interesting to think about them as, as ecologies, basically. Mm -hmm. So, two questions, I guess. Okay, thanks. 
So the first question is about hyper-romanticization of trees. I think this gets to the whole challenge that even uh, activists for endangered species have to deal with. It's always about the um, charismatic megafauna. So you always, people always want to save the elephant, but by getting, there was actually a great article in the New Yorker a couple weeks ago about, um, I think it was elephant conservation, realizing that what part of the organization's goals was to sh save also the very unattractive, not very charismatic species that are integral to the habitats that elephants rely on. But people are going to give money to elephants. They're not going to give money to, I don't know, um, a species we haven't heard of before, something that doesn't is not photogenic, for instance. So there, this is the challenge. The, the tree also serves as charismatic megaflora. You can use it as a signal or as an emblem for a larger enterprise. In some cases, it's for public relations purposes. It's marketing because it's a, something that is beloved, has positive associations. It's almost kind of anthropomorphic in its form. So it resonates more in cultivating pathos than the other species. And then your ulterior motive is to actually address these more ecological concerns. So part of it is my challenge is, speaking of trees and communication, they are a communication strategy to offer a front, an ambassador, to actually do more ecologically minded work. As long as you realize, as long as you, rather than reifying the tree, recognize that it is actually performing that political role. Some of the ways to do that are maybe to show the fact that there are so many tree planting campaigns that have failed because we have looked at them as kind of these atomized things. You just plant a seed every five, five, 10 feet, however many it is. Um, also, Contrasting um, to your question of whether or not the tree is inherently good in all situations, um, there was a great article in Places last a couple years ago about how grasslands, in particular, don't have the same photogenic, romantic, picturesque iconography that we can do a romantic painting or a painting of, but uh, they are just as biodiverse, if not more, than forests, for instance. So recognizing the grasslands, wetlands that again, um, don't maybe have the same romantic associations, aesthetic resonance that forests do, um, still perform vital work. And the hybridity, the diversity, recognizing that we have to have a kind of a, 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 um, an assemblage of all these different types of landforms and ecological kind of cultures. Uh, and then to your question about the one versus many, um, this again, it gets at the hybridity. I feel like I don't, I, I could write two separate books. Um, this one is still nascent enough that that's a really daunting idea. Uh, but I feel like one of the things I want to show is that this is a whole conceptualization challenge. Not only conceptualizing how do you use the tree as a symbol or an ambassador for the larger ecology, but also how do you recognize that our tendency to, to carve out the tree as this isolated entity um, uh, is part of the problem of the failure of street tree planting campaigns, of uh, one trillion tree campaigns, of not recognizing the regional nature of city forest relations, of how infrastructures work. So showing rhetorically, visually through the work of artists, different methodologies, how it's really hard. I don't think I want to separate them because part of the I challenge, the interesting challenge would, would be to show that um, the individual and the ecology perform kind of mutually supportive roles in both helping us understand how they work, in getting the policy and funding support for um, uh, conserving, restoring uh, these ecosystems. Um, yeah, I think that's, hopefully that's good enough for now. <laughs> hi. Yeah, hi. Oh, you can go ahead. Well, you can go. Okay. So after having studied trees, nature, and their historical trajectories so closely, how would you define sustainability in your own terms? And how do you think your data can lead to achieving that sustainability that you're defining? Wow, that's another really big question. Like, how do you solve climate change? No, but I'm I not guess, asking yeah. you that. But like, it's <laughs> a more personal question, I think, for you. I'm not asking for a solution. Mm -hmm. I think it's more like, what do you think after all of the research that you've done? Like, what does sustainability mean to you? And like, how do you think your understanding of it is going to have an impact on like the environment or the city like you're talking about? So that's great. That's great. I mean, there are plenty of people whose whole body of research is about sustainability, resilience. And you probably know there's debate over the political valences of these terms. Um, uh, I'm not sure what are some other synonyms people use that are, what are you saying? 
Oh, resilience and yeah. Um, I am probably not equipped to offer a definition, but I said the one thing that I can maybe offer based on my own history, my own areas of practice and expertise is reminding people that um, some of the projects, just based on some of the projects I've done, reminding people that like sustain, sustaining the information resources you need to perform ecological sustainability practices, that you can't just sustain the trees and the ecosystem. You also have to sustain the communities around them uh, provide care for the professional um, communities who actually have the expert knowledge and are going to perform the labor, and sustaining um, the archives to look at historical precedents, uh, the data that allows us to understand what works and doesn't. Um, so just realizing the sustainable, this again only expands the problem, which makes it seem even more daunting. But uh, there, I, just because I work with archivists and librarians, there are quite a few archivists and librarians who are interested in kind of archiving uh, sustainability practices around New York City, about sustainability resilience plans for um, um, kind of knowledge for information institutions. So there, are, if you distribute the responsibility across people in multiple professions, all of whom are kind of collectively engaged in this larger operation. This is like a distribute, this is like a mesh, a mesh of expertise to go back to kind of the root metaphors in a way. So I think this is part of my challenge is you mentioned, you called my talk dense. Some people call my talks like a torrent. That's kind of my, my signature, I guess. Uh, but it's always about expanding the field, but realizing it doesn't have to be a solo endeavor, that there are ways to build um, a knowledge commons of people with different areas of professional expertise, sustaining one another, recognizing that you know, care, repair, maintenance, all these types of, of things, maintaining um, technical infrastructure, ecological resources, human communities aren't all an integral part of the larger enterprise. So that's, a, I guess, an ambitious response to your question. I, I could have all this also called it generous. Right? <laughs> okay, that could, that's <laughs> and, nice too. And, and I, think, <laughs> I think dance is good. I mean, we need dance. <laughs> Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the really rich and dense uh, presentation, beautiful, thrilling. So, uh, my question is about sustainability, protecting the environment. G generally, uh, the mainstream narrative, not the scientific, the mainstream narrative uh, is always human-centered and western-driven. Uh, we, protect, we protect natural environments because we need them to survive. And then the, the non-human is seen as a passive, as an object, and the human is seen as the subject, so uh, active. So my question is, how can we change this mainstream narrative and, cre and create a new one about a future of repair where we understand nature and its languages? Maybe we give it a legal uh, uh, status, an authority. Uh, we decentralize uh, humans. Uh, I mean, how we researchers can change this mindset? Is it just about communication, the way we communicate with the world around, or, uh, or open to you? Yeah, well there was, a, there was a, you probably saw the stories about the orcas attacking boats, and people in the Atlantic, uh, kind of perennial curmudgeons, somebody had to write an article about like, the orcas aren't our friends. But like, do, the, do we have do the orcas have to be our friends for us to care about them? Is kind of a pop culture manifestation of the kind of the question you're asking here. But I don't mean to be romanticizing indigenous knowledge or extracting indigenous knowledge. But I feel like indigenous eco philosophies or political ecology has a lot to offer here. Um, there have been some great book, books published even in recent years that offer examples or explain the value of recognizing, looking beyond the human centered. There's a long history of, um, this might be before your time, but probably 15 or so years ago, there was a very popular philosophy called object-oriented ontology, uh, inspired in part by Bruno Latour, Grand Harmon. I'm glad we've grown beyond that, but that was a, one proposal of a way to think beyond the human-centric. But funnily enough, um, uh, the philosophers Cultivating the world of object-oriented ontology were kind of, it was a very egocentric, very human-centric, hero-oriented or kind of mode of philosophy. So there was a little bit of paradox in the way object-oriented ontology was actually practiced and the philosophies. This is rampant in the academy. People do not live the politics they write about very often. But, um, but in this case, 
Um, that was one attempt to kind of get at some of these issues. Um, uh, you know, nature documentaries is another thing people have tried to get us to understand. In some cases, those are also anthropomorphizing. So we relate to other species, supposedly to decenter ourselves by looking like, hey, they're just like us. They love each other. They mourn when they die, etc. So anthropomorphizing tends to help in helping us to identify and kind of encouraging us to identify with other species. But I think also considering the whole notion, again, indigenous notion of good relations. How do we make sure we're in good relations? And what defines good is not necessarily from a human uh, ego or anthropocentric view. So uh, a former colleague of mine, Max Lieberein, has a book uh, they published uh, maybe two years ago now called Pollution is Colonialism. The book title might not lead you to believe that it's about an entire proposal for a political ecology. They also run a lab at uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland called the Clear Lab that's all about performing feminist indigenous anti-colonial science. So they develop a bunch of methodologies, like how can you not just say you're anti-colonial feminist, but how do you actually develop research practices, protocols, um, means of knowledge sharing, even means of kind of record keeping, uh, of dissemination and publication that actually embody those politics. So those are a couple examples of places from which we can learn. Um, but just the fact that we've tried, there have been so many movements to try to decenter the human, um, and then they, become fashionable and then wane in popularity indicates that there's people have been asking this question for a long time. Um, hopefully the ones, I don't know, they're the ones right now are going to solve it, but I think um, uh, the fact that in indigenous philosophy has not just been, it's not, it's fashionable right now in the academy, uh, but it, it uh, has pre-existed its currency within a certain kind of fashionable circles. So the fact that it has um, been proof tested, it's not, um, it's something, it's actually more of a, a, a living philosophy than um, a, a body of theory, if that makes any sense. I this is one of those cases where I feel like I should have stopped talking five sentences ago, but um, so these are just some examples of people we can learn from. It's a really sticky challenge that I think people have been asking about for a long time, but maybe some of these recent books can offer a next stage of considering um, uh, methodologies for this political change. So we have a we have a few minutes left. Should we um, take a num We can take a bunch of questions and then. Oh, we have one here. Okay, excellent. Hi. Hi, Shannon. Hi. Thank you so much for your insight. Uh, I would like to bring the slime mold experiment conducted in Japan. That was an event that I like, immediately related to when I read your article. So the architects and developers in Tokyo probably built the train network across a lot, over a lot of years, responding to probably a lot of parameters that shape their decisions. And a slime mold that probably has no awareness can, seems to like follow the same logic and do it in much lesser time. Do you think studying arboreal intelligence and just research in this direction can offer an insight into this kind of collective intelligence? that can have direct architectural implications? Is there like a collective intelligence at play, a universal logic that applies to problem solving across species that we've not tapped into or properly understood yet? Uh, yeah, um, there was a, a couple years ago, I wrote an article called Mappings Intelligent Agents that's looking, trying to get into your question. Is it how do we think about cartography as something that's not a human directed enterprise? What if it's driven by artificial intelligence or by salmon or by slime molds? So how could, not just so how can we learn from them, but also recognizing there's a totally different way of perceiving, of experiencing, of the ontology of the world if we look at mapping kind of metaphorically defined from other species or other entities' perspectives. In this case, what we could maybe learn from slime molds or from trees is, um, first of all, maybe how to design transit networks, how to design other infrastructures, um, but also even the whole idea of the mycorrhizal communication, the fact that you know a, a wounded tree might reject or withdraw from a community, maybe offers some insight into um, can maybe offer some nuance to the discussion of maintenance. Uh, Caitlin De, De Silva, De Silvia, I think is her name, wrote a book called Curated Decay a few years ago, coming from historic preservation, arguing that in some cases, if it's not 
especially if you have like a, char a non-charismatic, or even a charismatic building to go back to that question of charisma. Maybe in terms of the, what it means to the society that it's a part of, or the larger architectural ecology it's part of, maybe actually sunsetting it, having a responsible way of bringing something offline, of not repairing it, of allowing it to uh, form of managed retreat or decay is actually the most ethical, um, responsible um, course of action. So maybe again, seeing how individual buildings fit into a larger ecology, looking at how they share resources through infrastructures, through how funding is distributed, what is maintained is what and what is not. Maybe that's a way to think about how tree knowledge or boil intelligence could inform design practices. I'd also say just even the approach to design itself, just the sharing of knowledge, the interdisciplinary teams that could be together. Um, uh, yeah, so that's even uh, the practice of design and thinking about like the interdisciplinary um, entangled uh, spaces that you are designing. That is kind of your end goal. Those are maybe two stages at which tree thinking could actually be useful. Well, Saron, this was uh, truly amazing. And I, I think that the format of the lecture was very unique. There was a sense of um, layers and the new layers were uh, activating things from the previous ones. Mm -hmm. And also there were all these uh, assemblages of different ways to, to understand knowledge from data to affections, to histories, to societies, to networks, to biologies, to physicalities, to, that I found truly effective in a way and fascinating in, the, mm. uh, in not only talking about intelligence but enacting intelligence uh, through this um, display or, 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 or ecology of, of ways of being trees and ways of connecting of us, ourselves and yourself being tree, right? That, that I, I found probably unique, probably I, I don't think there's been a lecture like this in this room uh, that is, is is, is presenting and enacting uh, what the tree or what trees together with others uh, uh, are in, uh, and how they uh, enact intelligence. I think that the, there was a moment that was actually fascinating for me. It's the moment that you compare all this ecology with the smart cities. And the smart cities seems to be something as you, you did with your hand, like imposed on, on other forms of intelligence, or other forms of existing intelligence. That, that in the way you, you explained, they were much broader, much complex, much more complex, much more rich, and, 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 and also much more interconnected with other things. And, and I wonder uh, how what you did today, what you presented today, and what you, you're doing through your work is also question, questioning the city as the allocation of intelligence and as the allocation of politics. And of course, this is very loaded because the way that you're describing intelligence is distributed, is interspecies or transpecies, uh, it's multiscalar. Uh, it's, there's many, many categories. It's happening through many different, or tr through the transition in many different forms of materiality. Uh, something that is difficult to capture with the, by the traditions that have claimed the city to be the space of political action, of, of culture, of intelligence, and somehow it, and, and a school like this is founded on the idea, it, you know, we have so many things that end with the city. You mentioned, for instance, the publishing house we have here is Columbia Books of, on Architecture and the City. Uh, we have urban planning, urban design, urban, you know, but mm -hmm. it seems old to me somehow when we see, or, or we're, uh, when we see all this unfolding that you brought today as the place where intelligence is allocated or through which is enacted and where all these rich forms of politics uh, that you talk about today uh, are allocated. And somehow I wonder if there's something of a critique to the hegemony of the city that could be added to the critique of, the, of anthrop anthropocentrism yeah. and and, and this kind of smartness of, of intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, every, if any, I don't know if any of you get, if any of you again have any aspirations to have an academic career, but 
when you have to go for tenure after six years, which means you put together a dossier and you have to reflect on all the work you've done up to that point and pr pretend that there has been, some cases there is, in my case there wasn't, I had to retroactively invent a logic that you know unified everything I did. And then you have to do it, go through periodic reviews where you have to show how there was some coherence to all the work you produced. And like one of the ways I always describe it is how intelligence moves across scales of design. And you were talking about the hybrid, the, the hybridity of the analog and the digital. I like to think about how data logics, modes of intelligence, ideally scale or interoperate across everything from the scale of the tiny gadget to the furniture we're using to the shape of this room. So um, in a really, in some case, uh, in a really well-designed or effective experience, there's some affective, intellectual, Mm, consideration that's actually unifying the choices, so there's some resonance between the logics and experiences that are, just, that are shaping everything from the gadget scale to the urban scale to beyond. Um, that that, that uh, resonance isn't always there, and I think those points of frictions are the kind of the interesting parts where you see um, where these inefficiencies come into existence that, that make you aware of the fact that there are different logics operating. The frictions actually um, um, compel you to pause and look at how there are different professional trainings, different priorities, different value systems that actually infuse these different domains of design. So I was asked in a podcast a couple about the book, maybe last two years or so ago, like why the city? And part of it is because it's like an interesting meso scale entry point to think about because there are so many path dependencies, so many infrastructures that are writ into funding structures, university curricula, um, training programs, dis professional identities, professional organizations, um, it's, a, it's a scale that resonates for all those reasons because there are, there's um, uh, not inertia, what's what I'm looking for, there's kind of a concentration of infrastructures, of protocols that actually concentrate around the city and there are just existing discourses you can tap into as well. But then you can scale up and down from the city to see how a city is actually an ecology of trees and multiple species. Our city is actually kind of a constellation of different interfaces through which people learn how its systems operate. Our cities are part of megalopoli or larger ecology, regional ecologies, but it just may be an entry point to some degree. Um, yeah, but it is interesting how many, going back to intelligence, how many different kind of disciplinary intelligences reify the city as this kind of atomized um, scale or, or stage of operation when it is ac really in actuality, and if it's done, I think, responsibly and well, we see how it actually connects to these operations at different scales, too. All right, I think uh, that's our cue. We're a little over time. Uh, please join me in thanking Shannon once Thanks, more. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.